So first of all, I wondered if we could talk about your kind of background in art and sculpture and how your interest in art came about. Um, I had always been artistically inclined from the time that I was very small. And <clears throat> I had a um, early love of, of comic books yeah. that facilitated my interest in graph, you know, graphic representation. So I would, I would copy comic book pages and draw my own superheroes and make my own stuff up. And that kindled my interest in drawing profoundly, which mm -hmm. continued throughout my, my childhood and into my teen years. And in high school, I became much more interested in, in fine art. I, uh, I saw uh, a very romanticized portrayal of Vincent Van Gogh starring Kirk Douglas called Lust for Life while I was at a summer program for art at a university campus and um, when I was 17. And from that point on, I just wanted to become a fine art painter. But when I got to college, the painting department was less than stellar. This was at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Okay. So I saw the sculpture department producing some pretty interesting things. So I, I switched my major to, to sculpture and um, still vacillated throughout my time in, at, at college because I did switch back to, I switched to illustration for a semester, but then I switched back to, uh, to sculpture again. Semester or a whole year, I forget. Um, I continued my sculpture studies in graduate school. Um, but what, during college and graduate school, I met a, a, a Russian, a, a Ukrainian born professor trained at a Russian academy. His name was Leonid Lerman. And uh, he was like my Obi-Wan. He sculpted better than anyone I ever met, drew better than anyone I ever met, had a completely different philosophy about sculpting and drawing than anything I ever encountered in um, college or grad school in New York. So uh, part of my reason for wanting to go study grad school in New York was so I could be closer to him because he was in New York. So the whole time I was in grad school, I was taking classes with him and even afterwards. And eventually I decided to go study where he studied, which was at Russia's leading sculpture uh, monument, monumental sculpture academy. It was called the Mukina Institute. Um, at the time, its name has since changed. And I went there for two years. Uh, and then um, that was that was pretty much that I got married there. I had a child there. We came home after two years. And uh, that's when I started my professional career. Wow. OK, so you you kind of um, you really went for it in terms of getting the, the training and the, the background. In yeah, I was, I was in school for 10 years. Yeah. Wow. OK, so during that time, did you learn anything about uh, coin engraving or numismatic art? Well, uh, um, well, at, well, while I was in Russia, that's where I was really, truly introduced to the proper way of sculpting relief. Um, and I held up, I, I, we had, you know, I was sculpting on a, like a piece of plywood, like a board, and I was doing a, a metal design. And as an example, I, I put, I, I stuck uh, a quarter, you know, just a regular George Washington, uh, um, quarter, Flanagan quarter, obverse, you know, mm -hmm. on the board so I could see it as a guide. My, my Russian teacher, uh, Svetlana Sergeyevna, who's, who's since passed away, came up to me, picked the quarter off my board and showed it to the entire class and said, this is, this is what good relief is. Look at this, look at this coin. This is how you do relief. And that really excited me. And, uh, you know, when I was in college, being in, going to college in Philadelphia, getting a job at the Mint was like this kind of like apocryphal, mythical thing. Yeah. You know, the chief, former chief engraver, Frank Gasparro, was from Philadelphia, and he did the reverse of the penny. And it was, it was I hate to use the word twice, but it was, it was like a, there was this mystic, mysterious, legendary status about the Mint. So when I was in school, basically, there were just a handful of places you figured you could get a a starting job as a sculptor. It was either the Mint, but that seemed impossible. Uh, There's a place called the Franklin, which was a which was a a, pri a private. Um, it's a private. Was a private. 
collectibles. Um, yeah. Fine, fine art collectibles uh, house. And then also this place called the Johnson Atelier, which did life-size statues and, and more. It was a foundry, but also a sculpture studio. So those, those were the things that I always had in the back of my mind as an option. And, and the mint always seemed like something that I, I wanted to do because I was told that I sculpted really very well when I was in Russia. But again, it seemed like it seemed like a close, it just seemed like this mysterious thing, you know. It didn't seem like something you could actually get a job with. Yeah. Because yeah, it's just, you know, it, 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 it was like, yeah, there was a mystique about it, you know. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Go on. Sorry about that. No, no. So so how did you you kind of had that education? You went to Russia, you've spent 10 years studying. How did you then turn that into a career? Was, was like, it easy to find a job when you came back to the U.S.? I, 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 got, I, I came home and kind of went, went, looked around for about a month and I found a job at the, the place called the Johnson Atelier, the Fine Art Foundry. Okay. And there I helped did life-size figures for, and more for about eight years. And I, was also, I also took the initiative to uh, get digital sculpting software for our department when it was apparent that the, that the organization was going digital. Mm -hmm. So I spent many years after work and on the weekends teaching myself digital sculpting software. And I also took a community college class in that direction. But, you know, I was kind of like thinking about getting a job in film or video games or this kind of thing. I, I didn't really ever see that, I didn't foresee that there was a way that I could leverage my new digital sculpting skills into a career making actual sculpture other than like somebody's assistant or something like that. Cause that's, that's what I did at the foundry. I would, I would, I would make models for famous artists, but it would be their, their product, you know? Okay. So uh, then, then um, the opportunity at the mint presented itself and um, I took advantage of that and I started here in 2005, I think it was August of 2005, July or August. Okay. And what, do you remember the first coin you worked on? Yes. My, uh, I did a, I did a, um, I did a design for the Utah State Quarter under the mentorship of, of, of future chief engraver, John Mercanti. Mercanti. He was not the engraver at the time. He was just kind of like the unofficial department head. And he shepherded my design along and it actually got picked. So I sculpted the Utah, uh, um, the, the Utah State Quarter. Um, and um, following that, my design for the George Washington um, presidential $1 coin, the golden dollars, they were kind of popular, popularly known. I did Washington, I did Jefferson, I think I got uh, Martha Washington, um, oh, shoosh, Abigail Adam, I did a bunch of them. Or my yeah. first year, I did a lot, I did a bunch of coins my first year. Um, and one thing that was interesting is the mint made me sculpt them all traditionally because they wanted, before they would, before the mint, I think before, rightly so, digital having been so new at the time and me being in me being so new they wanted to make sure that i understood the fundamental principles of relief sculpture for coin making before they would allow me free reign to just go digital and do my thing so i learned a tremendous amount even though i had a lot of experience sculpting stuff relief traditionally i learned a ton of stuff about coin making that first year when i sculpted everything in clay and plaster it was yeah Great education. Excellent. So coming back to the um, the kind of digital aspect. So you, you first got exposed to that um, in New Jersey at the Johnson Atelier. Is that right? It was, a, it was in a Princeton. It was a, in the Princeton area. And okay. um, I exposed my. They, I got exposed to the idea of digital there, but I was the one that I I I want to phrase this right. I um, pursued learning digital sculpture on my own independently 
independent of the of the organization. The organization at the time had a pretty closed door policy about who it was letting into the digital department. So I, I had to teach myself in order to what I thought was going to be preserving my job. Um, and uh, it proved to be effective because the owner of the of the of the place um, kind of gave me a position as, as as like one of the digital as the digital sculpting resource for the for the organization and you know it worked out worked out well you know it wasn't my favorite job in the world working there but it was a great stepping stone I was there for eight years so um, I, I it was very difficult and painful in a lot of ways. But I learned a tremendous amount, and I was, I was, you know, a lot of good people were there. Yeah. Okay. So when you initially started um, using technology to sculpt, were you completely open to that idea? Was that something you wanted to kind of embrace? Yeah, I think having been born as part of the first real video game generation yes. members, you know, I grew up with the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. In television, ColecoVision, all those old console games, and then pinball, I mean, excuse me, arcade games. Well, pinball, of course, that's not digital. Um, but, you know, all the arcade games and all that stuff. And I always had an interest in, um, in technology, uh, interest in space and stuff like that. But one thing that was cool was uh, I remember when I was in grad school in New York, I saw an article in, in some art magazine about... Uh, the production of portraits via scanning or scanning and then CNC milling, computer numerically controlled milling machines, which are like, like it's like a regular mill, but it, but it moves around in space on an arm and it cuts things out of stone or styrofoam or things like that. Mm -hmm. And that, that made that I saw, I just, I, it kind of felt like to me at the time that despite the fact that I was working in, in just with clay and charcoal and stuff like that, something spoke to me that, that I don't want to sound like I was prophetic or any, any pretentious stuff like that, but I definitely got a little, little tw twinge in my stomach saying that this was the future. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So do you think, or do you ever get um, either coin collectors or just, just kind of art, art critics or fans of art that that think digital is is somehow inferior to the traditional approach i think in all branches of of uh professional i won't say fine art but you know any type of professional art say it's coins or collectibles or anything like that there was a bit of a controversy early on as to what was better traditional or digital and um I know I was met with, I know that it was met with some skepticism uh, by, by different folks that I've worked with over the years early on in getting into it. But I think that that has, that dialogue has kind of come to an end and uh, re it's been resolved very peacefully. And now it's more of a question of, uh, you know, efficiency without a sacrifice of quality. And as long as, like my goal, you know, I started sculpting digitally for the mint. Like my goal was like, I don't want anybody to be able to tell that this, that this should be indistinguishable from something that was made by hand, yeah. the finished, finished product. And we were able to pull that off. I don't mean pull it off like, like, a, like a trick. I mean that we were successful in that endeavor. I was the digital, I did the digital sculpting part of it but then they had the, the, the tooling side of the manufacturing part of the division that handled making the, you know, the, the steel that to create the actual coins. And through, through a concentrated team effort, we were able to bridge uh, the bridge. We were able to build a bridge to the future for the United States Mint. And I think thereby for the rest of the world, because I honestly think with all due respect, in terms of the um, developing an engagement of the digital technology early on, I, 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 with all due respect, all, all mint, and this might be my own ignorance as well, but I think we were a world leader and still are in our engagement of that technology. 
yeah. uh, not because of me or anybody else, just because it's it's every nothing. You know, engravers, artists, you get a lot of credit, and that's cool. You know, you get your initials on the coin, and that's a tremendous honor. I don't want to downplay that, but the reality of it is, is every single product that's made by any mint is a team effort, and depending on the workflows of the respective organizations, it takes a small army of people just to get out the master tooling part of it. Um, you know what I mean, right? By master tooling, you know, the, yeah. the, the stuff that gets disseminated throughout the rest of the mints so that the facilities so that they can make their, their respective uh, products. But, um, and, but that's, uh, that, but other mints over the years, from what I've seen, I'm, I'm not really, really w well versed in the technical uh, capabilities of our colleagues around the world but I just see nothing but beautiful stuff being done all over. And it's, I think it's just, you know, a lot of people get, a lot of people, I think, a lot of people on the inside of the coin world, some people wonder about the viability of, the, of, the, of, of coins and currency as a, as a, as a utilitarian product. Um, but I think that it's, this is perhaps the most exciting time in modern history to be working at a mint. And I think there's more potential than ever. There's more potential for incredible products than ever before. And I think there's gonna be, a, you know, the collectors and um, fans of coins have a lot to, a lot to look forward to going, for, going into the future. Excellent. But I'm no expert, that's just my intuition. That's just my feeling. Yeah, no, that, sound, that sounds really exciting. So and it could also be my desire for job security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess so but no no that's that that does sound um really exciting and one, one thing um i wanted to ask as well was how does it compare working on something like a coin quite intricate quite small compared to the other kind of sculpting you were doing presumably you've worked on quite large scale sure well the one thing and i was just talking to a colleague today one thing that's Interesting is, uh, you know, when you're working digitally, there is no scale, really, because you can zoom in to something that's like an inch in diameter and make it so it it's 13 inches across on your screen or zoom in so the uh, just the eye of a portrait fills your entire screen. Mm. It's a completely different way of working. And um, even though the final product is sculpture, I think that the process itself is equally analogous to drawing as it is to, to, to sculpting. Because typically you use a stylus and you're sculpting on a glass surface. And, um, and it requires, it, re it relies on the, on the gesture of your hand the way drawing does. And you think in three dimensional space the way you do with drawing, but you're making a form that ultimately is realized as sculpture. So it's, it's, it's an interesting challenge, you know? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So I guess this, this might be a quite a difficult question to answer, but how, how does the process work from the very concept of a, a coin right through to, to kind of you, you finishing or you, you signing off your part of it? Is there, is there a lot of preparation in terms of artwork and different ideas? Well, we're all artists here in this department and we get to submit designs along with our artistic infusion program colleagues. And um, then the drawings get reviewed by committees, um, the CCAC and the CFA, and based on their recommendations, a design is selected for a particular product. If it's your design, you get to sculpt it, or you know, if it's a design by one of the uh, artistic infusion program artists, then, we, then I assign those out and uh, then they get sculpted. And um, some people, work in clay and have them ultimately digitized. Some people work in clay and also in 10 with digital software sculpting. And then some people work exclusively digital, digitally. There's no imposition on any, there's no requirement that anyone here work any particular way. The only requirement is that they work the way that's best suited for them to make the best possible product. Mm. And then once that is process is finished in tandem, uh, the the this, the medallic artists, as we're as they're called, as I used to be called, 
work in tandem with what are called product design specialists. These specialists are also artists themselves. And what they do is, is uh, ensure the coinability of, of the design before it goes into production. So that's basically it. You know, we have, we have a, a very practiced and successful pipeline in this side of, uh, in this corner of the mint. And um, we're very fortunate to be, I think, to be able to play the part in the process that we do. And it's a lot of responsibility. And um, everybody here takes it really seriously. Yeah. And how does it feel, you know, when you've gone through that process to actually see the coin or have one in your hand? I mean, it's always great. And it's easy to take it for granted after a long time. I've been here 15 years. Mm. But you, you never, you know, you never really take it for granted. You, you know, you see... When you see something that you worked really hard on and see that it's come out well, um, and it's going to represent, you know, not just the mint but your entire country to the world, it's a great honor, and it it's always a great honor. You know, it's easy yeah. to take it it's easy to take it for granted, but I don't think anybody who does it could be easy to take it for granted. I mean, yes, yeah. So um, I know your, your initials, Joe, are on the penny that's used in the US, is that right? Yes, that was the reverse of the penny was designed by a great artist named Lind Lindell Bass. So that's her actual drawing and I sculpted it. But we, what we, 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 we um, typically at the Mint, um, when there's a designer and artist, when they're separate people, entities rather, mm -hmm. both initials go on the coin, but if the sculptor was also the designer, then just that there's only one set of initials on the coin. I see. Okay. So are you, are you ever tempted to tell people if you see, you know, if you're in the, the store and you get some change, are you ever tempted to say, that's me? I did. I did some of that early on when it came yeah. out. Why? Or like, you know, when, when I'd be walking with one kid, find one tails up on the sidewalk. That was cool, you know. And um, yeah, I mean, it's really, that was a great honor to be assigned that. And um, I'm very fortunate, I guess it's, it, you know, I, I mean, I just, I just turned 51 a little while ago and I, I, I've been here 15 years and I started to think about the long run, you know, my portfolio of what I've done. And that's definitely a highlight, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, um, becoming the chief engraver, that must have been something really special as well. Yeah, that's one of the greatest honors of my life in any capacity, professionally or personal. Yeah, fantastic. And where, I mean, were you aware of the, the kind of history of that role and also just the many uh, coin engravers that have been active at the Mint in the past? Well, I was here when my former boss and mentor, John Mercanti, became the uh, 12th chief engraver, I believe it was, when he was, when he was, when he was named 12th chief engraver by Ed, uh, then director Ed Moy, I believe it was at the time. And um, so this is going to sound like self-serving, but even before John was chief engraver, you know, John served under uh, Frank Asparrow. And um, former chief engraver Frank Sparrow, and I hope I got that name right when I was talking about the, the, the apocryphal story about the penny. I may have said John McConty, but anyway, Frank Sparrow was the was the sculptor of the reverse of the penny, and um, John used to tell me that I reminded him. My mannerisms reminded him of Frank's, and John would John would always say that one day I was going to be chief engraver. You know, he'd always tell. And I just took it for, you know, I was like, ah, whatever, you know. <laughs> and um, and he was one of the first people I called when I got the job. And he just said, I knew it. I told you. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and what does the, um, sorry, carry on, Joe, carry on. No, 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 go on, please. I was just going to ask what, what the, the role kind of entails. So, you know, making that step up, it's obviously a real honor but is there a lot of responsibility that comes with it? Yeah, there's a lot more than I thought, honestly. Um, I, I still sculpt and draw, although not as much as I used to because I have managerial duties that include 
um, art directing. Well, I expected the art direct. I art direct all the 2D artwork from the outside artists and the inside artists. And then I also art direct um, all the sculpting that's done. I also get out all the assignments to the various sculptors and I have to meet the scheduled deadlines. We as a team have to meet them, but I'm old, if, if, if a schedule benchmark is missed, it's my responsibility more than, it's not the artist's responsibility, it's ultimately it's my responsibility. So, you know, we have a pretty, we have a, a pretty robust workload at all times. And, and uh, I take that responsibility very seriously to make sure the schedule is, is met with the highest level of quality, quality, and um, and uh, yeah, I mean, basically, there's a, there's a lot. There's a, I mean, it's not, but it's not like over. It's not overwhelming. Sometimes a little bit for me, but it's not that. I, I I feel like I've been growing into the role the more the longer I've had it, and yeah. I'm very grateful to have the mentorship of my supervisor Ron Harrigal. I mean, Ron really walks me through. A lot of the, you know, I won't say pitfalls, but there, you know, navigating the world of being a manager is is, is a very particular skill set. Yeah, and I, Ron's a, Ron's a, Ron's an incredible manager, along with John Mercanti. He's one of the best best people I've ever worked for, and he's really helped me um, get through a lot of this, the the harder stuff. And uh, be be productive and still be compassionate at the same time. And um, I also have to I owe a great deal of thanks to Director Ryder, David Ryder, for you know uh, trusting me with this position. You know, and um, he's he's also uh, he's 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 got a great vision and he's done a lot for the Mint. I think in the in the time I've been here, fifteen years. I know it's not his first time here, but. It, as a director, but he's, he's, I think he's doing a fantastic job. It's just a really great time to be here in general. Yeah. Just going on in the outside world. I know we're having a horrible, that's the other thing that's really cool is that we've managed to stay, I was talking to another colleague about this. Um, we are such a strong division and the Mint is so strong as a whole that despite what the world is going through, we've managed to stay productive and health. And, and I mean, I mean, institutionally healthy i don't mean i don't mean by a lot you know what i mean like mm -hmm. we've, we've managed to stay productive and vibrant despite everything that's going on in the outside and um and it's just a testament to all the people that work it's not just the, this division it's everybody that works at the mint and every and every facility in any capacity i always say that i don't want to sound like rah-rah pretentious but i mean it takes everyone in this building to make the coins and medals that we do you know, from 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 the custodial staff. I'm not saying that they're any lower, but I'm just saying from the custodial staff all the way to the superintendent's office. Every single person in this building and every other mid facility um, are equally equally important in the process. Yeah, one one of us can't do our jobs without the other doing theirs. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. You know, it's such a a difficult time for everyone around the world, but to hear those kind of you know, even if it's from a kind of a work perspective to see people coming together and and uh, getting on with things and doing the best they can is fantastic. Um, one thing, um, um, I know you've got so many different coins you've worked on, but would you be able to pick a favorite, do you think, if you had to? Yeah, honestly, I think, uh, well, the, both are medals. Reverse for His Holiness the Dalai Lama's Congressional Gold Medal was was a great honor in and of itself, but had but having gotten in two thousand and eight the opportunity to go to his hotel room in the morning with a with a group from the Mint and Don Everhart, the man who designed and sculpted the Avers, and John and just the whole the whole team. Wow, uh, an hour with His Holiness um, before going to the Capitol to, to watch. Uh, President Bush give him the medal and the whole thing and that was incredible but then also having done the I designed and sculpted the um I forget I think it was the outverse but for the Shanksville heroes of 9-11 I'm probably garbling the name 
but it's the Heroes of 9-11 Congressional Gold Medal, uh, the Shanksville, Pennsylvania site medal, designed and sculpted the obverse of that. And that just as a, as a, as a, as a, as a sculpture and design and piece of art, that, that's probably the most important thing I've ever done in my life, just for what it commemorated. Mm. Well, that's, that's really um, kind of such a poignant thing to have to do, isn't it? Or responsibility. So, I mean, how do you kind of, how do you kind of um, approach something like that that's so emotional? And, and how do you, is there a way you can kind of put that emotion into the design, into the artwork? Well, I think having studied monumental sculpture in Russia and learning how to invest yourself in the creation of a memorial or monument um, lent itself to my approach, doing either commemorative coins or, or medals that honor particular recipients in a certain way. Um, it's just, you know, basically, I think, I, I try and imagine what, what, it, what this product's going to mean to the people who it's going to mean something to. Mm -hmm. And I try and make it with an eye towards, you know, being worthy of their, um, being worthy of their cherishing that object that you, that you have a hand in making. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, that's kind of um, brought me to the end of the questions. One, one final question. Um, it's just what, what kind of, um, what does the future hold, do you think, for the US Mint? And do you have any kind of uh, projects that are on the go at the moment that you can tell us about? I think the future of the Mint is, is best described by uh, people above my pay grade. <laughs> but I wouldn't be here if I didn't think that this was not the place to be. For me, um, until I retire, I think the future of the men is bright, and um, I just, I, just, I'm very grateful for the, for the opportunity to be here, and um, and however long that is, I will be grateful for to it, for it to the end, and um, we're always working on new stuff. I, I'm never allowed to talk about it, but <laughs> I can assure you that you know. My goal is that as chief engraver is whatever we do is always going to be the best thing we've ever done. So I would just look forward to continued high standards being being met and presented to the American people and the world um, as a result of our efforts, collective efforts. Yeah. Okay. And with your um, your kind of experience in comic books or love of comic books and sci-fi, that kind of thing, do you think there's any any kind of future projects that might combine both of those interests for you in terms of coin projects? If I were to retire and, and, and then, then I could do different things for different minutes to do license stuff. But I have, I have, a, I have a very active um, personal side profile where I, I do collectibles and, and work in that world. So it kind mm. of satisfies that, that, um, that interest. So, uh, I feel very fortunate that I'm able to um, enjoy my, my, my passion for fantasy, sci-fi, and comics and still be chief engraver of the U.S. Mint and execute the um, you know, profound duty of, of uh, serving the Mint and, and, and the country by my you know, modest efforts here, I guess. I don't want to say, again, I hate to sound like I, I really feel this way. I really feel strongly about being here. I think it's like really, I'm really lucky to be in this job. They, any, any, they could have picked anybody else they wanted to and they picked me, so I feel very lucky. Okay, that sounds like a great combination of interests if you can do both of those things successfully. I, I think as a community of, of artists around the world participating in, in this craft, I think it's very, very strong. And great work is coming out. So, I mean, yeah, we're all individual mints and all that stuff. And of course, my, my, my mint to my country comes first, but I, I do have a profound respect for my colleagues around the world. And, um, and just like I would as any other branch of sculpture, I, I try to keep a, 
a universal perspective of what's going on because you can only learn by looking at other people's work. It's never going to hurt you. Or if you insulate yourself too much, you wind up becoming repetitive. And, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a boring thing. Yeah. So do you, do you um, collect any coins yourself? I don't really buy my own coins because my mother has bought all of them in triplicate going back. <laughs> okay. So she pretty much buys most of what I do and I uh, have that collection in, in safe hands. Um, yeah, no, I just, I just, uh, I don't, I really don't buy any art products that I participate in. It's not, you know, it's not because I don't think they're good or anything. It's just like, I'm always thinking about the next one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great, Joe. Thank you so much for your time and good luck with, with everything at the mint. Um, and, um, and stay safe. Thanks so much for your time. You too. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. I hope this is useful for anyone that, uh, that hears it. And I really appreciate being able to participate. And uh, again, thank you. It was very honored. Thanks, Joe. Speak soon. All right. Take care, man.